flour, sugar, and vegetable oil. Mm. The three legs on which every disease stands. Mm. Nobody should be consuming these things, including animals and birds. Nobody. Mm. So these are the first three things to remove. And you will find no matter what diet you decide to follow in the world, you know, starting from carnivore, where people live entirely on meat, yes. to vegan, you know, and with everything in between. The first two months, every improvement you have comes from removing processed carbohydrates. Absolutely. Removing bread, pasta, everything made out of flour, sugar, soft drinks, breakfast cereals, porridges, you know, all that. That's something we can all agree on. You know, that comes Absolutely. up time all after time. Yes. So no matter what you're actually eating, mm. the benefits in the first two months of you following any kind of diet come from removing these three things. So always remove them first. That is the most important thing. Uh, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, welcome to my podcast, Your Body's Way. This is such a pleasure and an honor to be speaking with you right now. Um, first of all, how, how are you doing? Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Great, great. Um, I wanted to basically just start the podcast um, just by, first of all, um, just kind of telling you my my gratitude for the work that you've done. Um, I've been a massive follower of your work for, um, gosh, God, since 2007, when um, Put Your Heart in Your Mouth, the book came out. Um, and it was the first time that I've actually read about, you know, um, the how we should be not afraid of fat and how, you know, cholesterol isn't a bad thing. And, you know, all of the things that we've been advised to eat in the UK and around the world, you just basically debunked it all. And it was such a powerful book for me. And um, I have to say that book is probably why I decided to like specialize in nutrition and to kind of go into it a bit more. So first of all, I just wanted to say a big, big thank you to you for that. That's a pleasure. I'm glad that you found that book because uh, th that propaganda has been launched um, in 1952, a long time ago now, more than 70 years ago. And it was based on a lie. Basically, it was um, launched by a person who had no integrity. And the idea was that animal fats and cholesterol cause heart disease. <clears throat> and since then, huge and very profitable industries have been built based on that idea. Pharmaceutical industry makes billions. Food industry makes billions. Agricultural industry makes billions. Western governments make billions. And uh, Western medicine makes billions. Medical industry makes billions. And no matter how many scientists, and there are hundreds and hundreds of honest scientists all over the world who have debunked that theory, the diet heart hypothesis, who have shown that animal fats and cholesterol not only don't cause heart disease, they prevent it and they reverse it. The best guarantee of not getting heart disease is by eating plenty of butter and eggs and bacon and fatty lamb chops and pork chops and <laughs> the rest of it. That's what I'm saying. You know, it's mind blowing. That's what that's what true honest science tells. But no matter how much the honest science comes up with the proof of this, <clears throat> the propaganda coming from these powerful and wealthy entities in the world becomes more and more intense. And it just seems <laughs> majority of humanity are not moving anywhere from that point. It's it's so scary um, when you read about it, when you hear about it, and it really makes you want to pay attention to um, not the mainstream, but what people like yourself are speaking about and, you know, shouting from the rooftops to anybody who wants to hear. Um, I remember at the time when the book came out, I was teaching um, fitness courses. So the fitness course was about five days of nutrition. So I was teaching a, a classroom of about 25 people each time. Uh, five days of nutrition and I remember the nutrition section was basically based on the eat well plate the government guidelines and um but after reading your book I would say to them okay so this is what you need to know for the exams like the UK guidelines but this is what you really need to know and I'd start going on about you know your book and other books that were very similar as well and um it was just it was an absolute ball like it was it was absolutely brilliant in the classroom so um 
I oh gosh just the whole diet heart hypothesis is such a big thing but but today um, I wanted to discuss with you obviously the gaps diet and the importance of the microbiome because no one can dig into it quite like yourself so before I kind of ask you a bit more about that we really delve into it um, I just first of all wanted to um, ask you about what you're doing at the moment in the UK because I know that you um, are a generative farmer and you are creating a um, a beautiful paradise basically from your home where people come and they watch you um, you know see how you do your farming how you look after the land how is that for you? It's wonderful <laughs> it's wonderful it was a logical progression um, of working for decades with food because the more you work with food the more you realize that you have to produce your own food that's the only way to produce truly healthy and good food for yourself mm. when you put your love into it and then it gives its love back <laughs> to you so 10 years ago my family and I found a piece of land in, in Norfolk in East Anglia <clears throat> and uh, it was a very damaged piece of land it was farmed conventionally by arable industrial agriculture for more than 100 years with chemicals and everything else so there was no soil on the farm literally we discovered that there was no soil it was destroyed because that's what arable agriculture does it destroys soil soil is the most precious part of nature that's where all life begins and all life ends if there will be no soil on our planet there will be no life because soil is the source of growth of plants and plants provide the food web for everything else on the planet so we started creating soil and uh, we are organic we are regenerative we have all the animals that we can have here the birds and our birds and animals are working very hard on creating soil because that's how soil was created on our planet in the first place by huge millions of heads of herbivorous animals and birds because their excrements their manure their urine create soil they create the microbial community because soil is a microbial community so for fast forward to 10 years now we we live in a paradise literally and it's amazing how resilient nature is that you can take a very damaged piece of land and turn it into a paradise within 10 years literally we are completely self-sufficient in food we buy salt spices <laughs> we buy fish obviously and olive oil and that's it that's about it everything else the land provides for us and not only for us but for hundreds of volunteers that we uh, have on the farm we have young people coming from all over the world young and not so young you know people of all ages come to uh, to us to learn how to be an organic farmer how to be self-sufficient how to produce your own food and when we started we didn't know the first thing about it we were city people you know we didn't know we have had no idea <laughs> how to produce our own food we made many mistakes on the way which we've learned from so now i'm writing a book exactly for that kind of reader for a person who uh, has no idea but would like to start producing their own food would like to be closer to nature would like to work with land and animals and birds and that's that will be the book for these people that's what i'm doing at the moment and um, I love how you operate, because that's exactly how you operate. You find the biggest question that your clients and that your followers have. And you're like, OK, so rather than answering them individually, I'm just going to write a book. And that's how, <laughs> you know, put your heart in your mouth came about. And um, I know your most recent book, um, The Gutton Physiology Syndrome. And you also did one for vegetarians as well. Um, so I can imagine that it, the, only, the, the reason why, you know, you wrote those books is because, you know, there are so many questions coming out about what you do and you're just like, yeah, just let me, let me just write a book about it. Like that's just the easiest thing for me to do. Um, so there's no, um, there's no surprise there that you're writing a book about how to, you know, be self-sufficient. Because when you answer one question that creates 10 more questions, you answer 10 more questions that creates a hundred questions. <laughs> Exactly. So I to cover all of that in the book and and every person every time they read the book they, they discover something new yes yes 
I'll, I'll, I've got my books here. I can I can demonstrate them. This is the first one yeah, you were talking about. Oh my god, that's a classic. That's I've got it in my bookshelf. Book. It's dog-eared, highlighted with like all different colors over the years. Yeah, that's that's my book. So this, this is the book about heart disease. Yes. If you want to understand what causes heart disease, what causes Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, obesity, um, and other manifestations of um, metabolic syndrome, because that's a metabolic syndrome, all of it. <clears throat> Please read it. All of my books are written for people, for, for lay people, for people who are not scientists, who are not medical professionals, but they are fully referenced for those professionals and for scientists. So it's, it, it, it covers everybody. Everybody can enjoy these books. But my main work is GAPS, and, uh, which stands for Gut and Psychology Syndrome and Gut and Physiology Syndrome. And there are two books, both abbreviate to the same GAPS in the English language. There are two books, one I've written uh, almost 20 years ago now. It's called Gut and Psychology Syndrome. This one covers the brain. Where does all mental illness, all learning disabilities, all kinds of dysfunctions of the functions of the brain come from? Any kind of abnormality in that area. Please read this book. You will understand where it's coming from and what to do with it and how to get rid of it. Because you can. And the... Uh, the same cause that causes every mental disease and all brain dysfunctions, the same cause causes all chronic degenerative conditions in the rest of the body. And this book came, in, came out in 2020, which focuses on the rest of the body. It is called Gut and Physiology Syndrome. It's blue. All my books have this signpost on them. They just have different colors. Yeah. So this is the newest book. It covers all autoimmune illnesses, allergies, arthritis, neurological illnesses, hormonal abnormalities, uh, all kinds of physical conditions, asthma, eczema, psoriasis, skin problems, anything, <clears throat> any chronic condition, because all diseases begin in the gut. And I'm, I'm so glad you said that because that, would be, that was going to be one of my questions. Is it true? that all disease begins in the gut and 100%, 100%. Yeah. This statement was made by the father of modern medicine, Hippocrates, thousands of years ago. And now we realize just how correct he was. He was absolutely correct. Every chronic disease, no matter how far away from the gut it might manifest itself, its roots are in the gut. Yeah. It yeah. originates in the digestive system. Let me explain why. Now we know with our modern research that human body is a microbial community. There are more microbes in you than there are human cells. You are a, a sophisticated, rich microbial community. There are all kinds of creatures in you, fungi, bacteria, viruses, protozoa, archaea, all kinds of creatures. And they live together in a balanced, harmonious community. That's the only way how nature operates. Nature operates on harmony on balance. In, in a balanced microbial community, every microbe fulfills its functions and every microbe is present and they all control each other. They don't allow each other to get out of control and start causing trouble because every microbe in the world can cause disease. But as long as they are together in a balanced community, they regulate each other, they control each other and they keep you healthy and well, full of energy, full of vitality, enjoying your life, having a body that serves you very, very well. If you ask any microbiologist, what is the most powerful influence on any microbial community in nature? The answer will be immediate, food. Food. You change food supply to a group of microbes in a petri dish, within a couple of hours, everything will change. Certain species will disappear, other species will appear, and the whole microbial community will change because food is the most powerful influence on any microbial community in nature. Where do we place food in our bodies? Into the digestive system, of course. That is why the majority of your microbial community in your body lives there, in the digestive system. That is your main ministry, that is your headquarters, that's your government, your parliament, you know, of your microbial community, your, 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 your um, you know, main, um, military quarters, everything is, is in there. Everything that makes decisions in your body is there in the digestive system okay. because that's where you place your food. And that means that food is the most powerful influence on human health. 
because your body is a microbial community. There is nothing that can even get close to the effect of food on your health and disease as well. So whenever you get any chronic disease, any kind of chronic illness, it is food first and foremost that you have to look at and you have to change. Because there, there, are, there are so many different um, avenues that someone can look at health. They could say, oh, you know, my stress caused it or environmental toxins caused it or, uh, you know, pollution and so on. Um, but you're saying, no, food is the number one place. Number you need to one. Visit. It's a key. It's yeah. an absolute key. Because if, you, if your microbial community is strong and robust and healthy and properly fed, and if your body is made out of quality materials, because your body is made out of food that you eat on a daily basis. Your okay. body renews itself all the time. Cells are born all the time. Cells die every day. Many cells in your body only live a few days. Mm -hmm. They get old, they work very hard. They get old, they get they die, they get shed off. And new baby cells are born to replace them. When the body gives birth to trillions of baby cells every day, it needs building materials to make those cells from something, right? Where do the building materials come from? From food. Yep, from from food. food. So if you're eating poor quality food, your body is made out of poor quality materials. Right. And if you take two people, one person with robust, healthy body made out of quality materials, and a person with a body made out of rubbish, <laughs> <laughs> and you present them with the same kind of stress, this person will not even notice. They'll sail through it. The other person will fall apart yeah. from that stressful event. And toxins are also stress, chemicals, toxic metals, anything in the environment. If you have a robust, strong body made out of quality materials, the way Mother Nature intended us to be, you'll sail through it. It'll be like water off a duck's back mm. or goose back, you know, and you won't even notice. You, you will deal with that situation and uh, you'll be fine. But a person who is already weak, and made out of who's, who's, who lives in a body that is uh, made out of poor quality materials, they will fall apart. They will have a, a nervous breakdown. They'll have they'll, they'll uh, fall into physical illness, mental illness, or something else. There's um, there's this really powerful experiment that you quoted um, online recently, and um, it, it basically explains the power of the microbiome, like what we're talking about here. So it's 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 my wish that everybody listening to this episode comes away having a, re a renewed respect mm -hmm. for their gut microbiome. And oh my gosh, I need to start treating it with respect right now because that's how important it is. And so the microbiome, you know, it, it's in charge of digestion and detoxification and just so many ab absorption. It has so many functions in the body. And to explain the power of it, you mentioned an experiment about two groups of mice and one group um, that they were they were both given mercury to like into their system. And one group um, had a healthy microbiome and the other group didn't. And then, but the ones with the healthy microbiome, they only absorbed about 3% of the mercury, whereas the ones with the unhealthy microbiome absorbed a, a, a crazy amount, like 98% of the mercury. And, and that just explains the power of the microbiome. Like if your microbiome is balanced, then it, it, it knows what to do. It does the right stuff. It absorbs the right stuff. It breaks down the right stuff. It gives you perfect health. Whereas if the opposite is true, then that's just one way of explaining how, look, you know, this is what can happen just with this experiment. Like God knows what else can happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. The problem is we live in a world which is literally conspired to destroy your microbiome. <laughs> everything, if you're buying your food from a supermarket, everything you're eating for breakfast, lunch and dinner and in between is full of antibiotics. Because who stocks the shelves in the supermarkets? Industrial agriculture. Industrial agriculture uses hundreds of poisonous chemicals, most of which are antibiotics in their nature, broad spectrum antibiotics. And every bit of food that you get, get from the supermarket is laced with these chemicals. Mm -hmm. You are eating antibiotics <clears throat> for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. 
And antibiotics kill antibiotics? microbes. Exactly. What do they do? They kill microbes. They don't kill. No antibiotic can kill everything. It kills just a certain group of microbes. And that certain group was part of a balanced, harmonious community where everybody controls everybody. Mm -hmm. When you knock out part of it, the harmony is gone. The balance is gone. So things that remain, which were controlled by those microbes, now get out of control mm -hmm. and become pathogenic. They start digesting food in their own way, producing millions of poisons, downright poisonous chemicals. At the same time, they damage the integrity of your gut wall. Your gut wall becomes porous and leaky. Holes develop in your gut wall, mm -hmm. literally. So these chemicals absorb, all these poisons absorb. So your digestive system, instead of a source of, to be a source of nourishment for you, becomes a major source of toxicity in your body. You have a river of toxins flowing from your gut, absorbing into your blood, into your lymph, and carried around the body. And wherever this toxic river gets to, it causes disease. Yep. If it gets into your brain, it will cause any mental illness. If it gets into the brain of a, um, a developing child, or a baby, a toddler, a small child, it will cause autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, oppositional defiant disorder, uh, any other abnormality in, in mental uh, development of the child. Because the brain gets poisoned. These are poisoned children. 100%, from my point of view, 100% of autistic children in our world and hyperactive children were born with a perfectly normal brain. These were perfectly normal babies, but they acquire abnormal gut flora from their mommy and daddy, mm -hmm. and their gut becomes porous and leaky, and their digestive system poisons them. Their brain gets poisoned. That is why, depending on the mixture of poisons coming into the brain, depending on other situations, one child will become autistic, another child will become hyperactive, another will have attention deficit disorder, dyslexia, dyspraxia, aggression, oppositional defiant disorder, or something else or diabetes type one, depending, you know, if this toxins get somewhere else, the child or the adult can de develop diabetes type one, asthma, eczema, allergies of, of all sorts, arthritis of any kind, autoimmune illnesses, allergies of all kinds, neurological disorders, hormonal abnormalities, you name it, every chronic disease begins yeah. in the gut. So, you know, this is really serious what you're talking about. And um, what is the prevalence of people with um, unhealthy gut uh, microbes, like a, a abnormal gut um, microbiome? What's the prevalence? Is it, um, do most of us have an unhealthy gut, but we just don't express the symptoms that some others do? Um, what is the prevalence? I wish somebody was counting. Yeah. Because in order, in order to have statistics, somebody has to go out and actually research, mm. collect statistics, you know, ask people questions, analyze the data and so on. Nobody's researching this at the moment. What percent of the world is has abnormal gut flora, yeah. has damaged microbiome in their bodies? From my point of view, in the Western world, the majority. I was going to say, and, yeah. The majority. And the problem is that... Um, with every generation, younger generations have it much worse than older generations. Mm -hmm. Many people in this world say, well, you know, we've created such a comfortable world, we're living longer and longer, uh, so what are we going to do, kind of thing, expecting that their generation of 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds are going to live to their 90s. Not so, mm -hmm. not at all. Uh, people who lived into their 80s and 90s today were born before the Second World War. The whole planet was organic. Mm. Just think about that. Yeah. There was no other food. There was just food. Mm -hmm. And it was all organic. There were no vaccinations. There were no antibiotics. And their parents passed to them perfectly healthy gut flora, microbial flora, because mother and father passed their bodily microbiome to their child. Mm -hmm. The mother starts doing it during pregnancy, during nine months of pregnancy. She passes her microbiome to the baby. And then uh, at the moment of birth, as the baby goes through the birth canal, the baby swallows lots of microbes which live in mother's vagina, mother's birth canal. And that flora comes from two sources. One is the mother's bowel, her digestive system. Mm -hmm. And another one is from the father. Because if the father has abnormal gut flora in, in his uh, gut, 
that travels out and populates his groin and all the organs in that area, and he shares it with the mother on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So that's how Mother Nature organized it, so that the mother and the father pass their microbial community to the baby. If we look at those generations of elderly people, they were born uh, at the time when their mothers and fathers passed in intact, healthy human microbiome to them. And that is your constitution, basically. They passed robust, healthy, wonderful constitution to these people. And then these people went through all the childhood infections, which are absolutely necessary for the child to go through because they mature the child's immune system. It's, it's, it's like universities, every infection like that, measles, mumps, rubella, chicken pox, and so on. They are like a university, every one of them, for the immune system of the child. It teaches the child's body, the, the child's whole microbiome and, and the immune system, how to live in this world, how to live on this planet, what kind of things they can encounter on this planet and how to react to them appropriately. It is a fact, a known fact now, confirmed by many scientific studies, that people who went through these infections in their childhood, instead of getting vaccinations, virtually never develop allergies or autoimmunity or cancer. Because their bodies were properly educated. How to respond to this environment, how to live on this planet. So those generations, you know, they got a robust constitution. They went through these infections. In, in their childhood. They, they never had antibiotics in their childhood. But then antibiotics came onto the market in the Western world, certainly in the developed world, in the 50s and the 60s. So if the parents at that time got maybe one or two courses of these antibiotics, because at that time they came out like as a wonder drug, mm -hmm. which has no harmful effects whatsoever. You can have as many as you like. And uh, those antibiotics damage the gut flora slightly. And they passed that slightly damaged gut flora to their children. Then their children grew up in a very different world. They grew up in a world where antibiotics were given to them through their childhood and youth for every cough and sneeze regularly. Yeah. Where industrial agriculture appeared on the planet. All the chemicals that were used by um, Nazi Germany during the Second World War in concentration camps were then repurposed for agriculture without changes virtually without changes. Oh gosh, yeah. so bad so, when you hear it. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, so the food started getting more and more laced with these chemicals, which have a damaging effect on our microbial community. Then in that, in that generation, girls were put on a contraceptive pill at quite a young age, which they took for quite a few years before they were ready to have their first child. Contraceptive pill has a devastating effect on the microbial community of a human being. It changes it quite dramatically. It changes the immune system as well. And uh, put the, the junk food that came in and all sorts of chemicals came in and all sorts of other things, the environment has changed. So that generation of people, by the time they were ready to start their family, to have their first child, had seriously damaged gut flora yeah. compared to the generation of their parents. And they passed that seriously damaged gut flora to their children. And every year the situation is getting worse and worse, deeper and deeper. This is a huge avalanche coming upon humanity. We're already weeping a terrible fallout of, of, of this uh, situation. Already we have an epidemic of autism. Yeah. We have an epidemic of ADHD. We have epidemic of allergies. We have epidemic of cancer, epidemic of heart disease, epidemic of autoimmune illnesses, epidemic of mental illnesses. Now we have an epidemic of hormonal abnormalities in people. We have all mm -hmm. sorts of epidemics. The population of the most industrialized part of the world is sick. Yeah. You can hardly meet one healthy person who is truly healthy, who is actually being honest with you when they answer that question. I mean, it's, it's like we're at the center of the perfect storm of just all of the terrible, all of the things that could happen to a person's gut, like, you know, like you said, medications and vaccinations and um, the food that we're eating. It's, it's all kind of coming to a head. Um, a, a famous experiment comes to mind, you know, um, uh, it's a uh, Pottinger's cats. Is mm -hmm. it, am I getting that right? Is it Pottinger? That's right. Yeah. Pottinger's Pottinger cats. cats. Yes. And um, yes. that's right. And um, in that experiment, they took um, cats and they fed them um, westernized foods, I believe. And within four generations, the cats died out 
So, um, you know, but as, but as the generations were progressing, their health was getting worse and worse, like their fur was changing, uh, it was becoming more matted and less shiny, and um, their personalities were changing as well, they were becoming more aggressive, and, um, you know, they weren't behaving as well as the original cats, and it kind of, um, you know, what you're saying about our generations, about how it's getting progressively worse, there's the sort of like mirror image there, but I, I, but I do have a question for you because I'm a mother and I, I imagine a lot of mothers are listening to this right now. Um, whenever, <clears throat> whenever our children have anything, um, any sort of pain in their ear or any sort of, you know, throat problem or cold or that we're given antibiotics just like sweets, basically. Um, I can't tell you how many packets of unopened antibiotics I have in my cupboard right now. And um, I've been fighting it so far with my children. Um, is there a, um, a healthy way to help beat infections for our children rather than heading to antibiotics straight away? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a GAPS diet. That's right. Let's get into that. We have a GAPS <laughs> nutritional protocol. It is a special diet that was designed and it's described in these two books, in the blue book and the yellow book, you know, in this book, and in this book in detail, this, this diet. This diet is designed to normalize your microbial community. Through that microbial community, you will rebalance and make your immune system so robust and so strong that it will protect you very, very well. And at the same time, the diet will build your body, rebuild mm -hmm. your body out of quality materials. Robust, strong, quality material. Your bones will become heavy and strong. They will not break so easily. You will have no osteoporosis. Majority of people in, in the world now, in the Western world, have osteoporosis. Small children, young people have osteoporosis. Because, because of, of poor absorption? Poor because of what they eat, they eat poor quality food. And, they, and they're drinking soft drinks, which have acids mm. in them, which actually wash out calcium from the bones. They actively cause osteoporosis. It is a known fact that Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, and other colas, they, they, they cause osteoporosis in people. So, you know, your bones become strong and robust. Your connective tissue in the body that holds you together, the collagen that holds you together becomes strong and robust. You are just, you just become indestructible. <laughs> you, you become As very, very, be. that's right, as you should be. It is our birthright to have a perfect body. That the perfect bodies, our bodies are tool we use in this world for this short period that we call life uh, on this planet, in this environment. And uh, it should work properly because anybody would understand, you know, which tool is easier to use, a tool that functions well and well oiled and a, or a tool that's half broken. You know, which is more comfortable to use, <laughs> which is more effective to use. Right. But also, but also um, you know, the body functions well, but also it's our birthright to be happy, as you'd say. It's it's our exactly. birthright to, to exactly. have a healthy brain, to, to feel good and to get the, you know, the dopamine, the serotonin. Like, I, I don't want to go down too much of a rabbit hole right now because I know that's a big topic as well, the brain. and But anyway, please continue. Yeah. Some of these little children who, who spend their lives eating rubbish, they start their uh, morning with a, um, a, a porridge, a quick you know, quick porridge that is cooked quickly. It's got addictive chemicals added to it. Mm -hmm. Small toddlers and children get addicted to this porridge from a very young age. As a result, they refuse all proper food. They just want that porridge. Yeah. You know, the propaganda has done, uh, the, the advertising has done a very good job of convincing parents that this is a healthy breakfast. It is a poison. You, you, you're turning your child into a drug addict by giving the child this quick porridge in yeah. the morning. Breakfast and, and and to say drug addict, I mean it's right. You stand by it like one hundred percent. You're like, no, it's drug addiction. Like that's it. There's no other way. So to when say these it. children are not fed like that properly, <clears> the bodies <throat> are made out of that porridge, which is nutritionally empty. They actually tell you that they're not happy. They're miserable. All they want to do is sit on the sofa and play with their gadgets. Yeah. Watch something on on the laptop or on TV or whatever, you know, or, or on a mobile phone. And uh, if they fall or, or something, some, or they move a little bit, they complain that my body feels broken. Mm. It hurts. And indeed, their body is a tool that is half broken and made out of rubbish. And it feels very uncomfortable to live in that. That's why they're miserable. That is why they're not happy. 
That's why they're not sunshines. <laughs> yeah. You know, and they don't run around climbing trees and jumping and running and playing and bouncing off when they fall over. When they fall over, they fall over like 80 year olds. They can literally fall apart when they and fall I, over. And, and on top of that, um, because of the blood sugar roller coasters that they're on, um, to add insult to injury, it just means that they want even more of the stuff. You know, when their blood sugar levels crash, that's when they need more. They're just like, give me the next tip. And, that's um, right. you know, that's that's, that's the, the the sad part. That's processed that's processed yeah. carbohydrates, which are heavily promoted by food industry, mm. by medical industry, by a pharmaceutical industry, by governments, by every mainstream agency, which are profiting from these things. These are high carbohydrate foods, processed foods. Everything made out of flour, soya, vegetable oils, sugar, high fructose, corn syrup, your breakfast cereals, your bread, your pasta, your porridges, you know, anything made out of this. Stuff. So can I, can now, I, sorry. All, all of this, it yeah. causes unbalanced blood sugar level. It breaks the mechanisms of blood sugar regulation in your body. Mm. So when the child has that sort of thing, when they have a, a breakfast cereal in the morning, their blood sugar shoots way above normal. So the child becomes manic. You're scraping them off the wall. You know, they get this uh, energy boost and at the same time they ants in their pants and uh, at the same time they cannot focus. They cannot learn, these children. They cannot sit still. They, they don't hear you, these children. But then half an hour later, an hour later, the, the mechanisms that switch on in the body to get rid of that excessive blood sugar because blood sugar is such a thing that the body regulates very strictly yeah. and too high, too low can kill. Yeah. That is why the body has very strong mechanisms of bringing it down or compensating. So when you've caused that boost of, of sugar in your blood, half an hour later, 40 minutes later, it drops way below normal. And the child then feels awful. They've got a headache. They're sweaty. They're clammy. They're unhappy. They're inconsolable. They may have tantrums or they become lethargic, you know, and, and they crave sugar. So you give them a chocolate. You give them a snack, you give them a packet of crisps, you give them a soft drink or something like that. And up they go again. Mm. And the whole day they go up and down, up and down on this roller coaster, this swing, blood sugar roller coaster. And uh, um, that comes with its behaviors. And the behavior looks very much like a bipolar disorder because they swing between being manic to depressive, manic to depressive. Mm. We're now diagnosing, psychiatrists are now diagnosing two-year-olds with bipolar disorder and putting them on medication. And all, all, the, all the child needs is for mom to get herself back into the kitchen and start cooking proper food for this child instead of feeding the child rubbish out of packets. So would you That's say... That's all it requires, yes. The yeah. child doesn't have a bipolar disorder. The child is being fed poison. The child is poisoned. That is why the child is behaving this way. So would you say, I mean, you've just been describing a child who, um, when when they haven't eaten, they're, they're maybe sweaty, clammy, you know, climbing up the walls and so on. Would you say for children, there's a scale for this? Because, um, for example, my children, um, they they don't necessarily get the sweats and they don't necessarily, you know, uh, you know, kind of crave much. Um so would you say that children are on a scale, but overall they're all on the same path, like eating the wrong foods, poor microbiome, and they all have a different um, scale of that reaction you just explained? Because I'm just thinking of other, other mums right now listening, thinking, okay, I understand that, but my child doesn't doesn't get those um, symptoms. Or do you not think they're just missing it? So Yes, not every child is, is on a blood sugar roller coaster. Mm. And it's not necessarily uh, what would show itself as such drastic changes that can be diagnosed as a bipolar. Mm. But, you know, the, the child can be mean. Mm. The child can be tired, unhappy. And it manifests itself with allergies, asthma, eczema, uh, skin rashes, reactions to food, headaches, poor sleep, and just uh, clinginess being clingy, not being able to focus at school, mm. being bullied, very much a sign of gaps. 100% of children wow. who are bullied in school are gapsters. That's, a, that's incredible. You change their diet, he will stop getting bullied. Because these children are weak. They're not only physically weak, they're, they're mentally weak and they're spiritually weak, for most, for most, you know, most uh, importantly. They're spiritually weak 
because they live in a weak body. That is why the bullies sense it and they zero on those children. You change the child's diet, your child will become strong physically, mentally, and spiritually. Oh. And everything will change. So um, when it comes to mental health then, because um, I can't wait to get into the diet um, and how to actually solve this problem. But before we go into that, I'd like to just ask about uh, mental health and autism, depression that occurs um, in children and in adults as well. How does a um, abnormal gut flora lead to mental health issues? Because people don't usually make that connection. So what is that connection? It's absolutely 100% connection. When I started talking about it 20 years ago, uh, you know, many people thought I was crazy. Now, now our science is coming up with um, study after study. There are dozens of studies now that came out which demonstrate that gut flora causes autism, gut flora causes schizophrenia, gut flora causes depression, gut flora causes rheumatoid arthritis, gut flora causes multiple sclerosis, gut flora causes every chronic disease. Yeah. So it's, you know, it is scientific information now. This is not some conspiracy theory. Yes. <laughs> at yes. All. Right. So, um, with autism, with mental illnesses, the child or the adult has abnormal gut flora. It's a gapster. This, per this purpose, this person is a gapster. What's a gapster? A person with abnormal gut flora, damaged gut flora. The gut wall as a result is damaged. It has holes in it. It's porous and leaky. So the food doesn't get a chance to be digested properly before it absorbs. Mm -hmm. It absorbs undigested. Mm -hmm. Practically every protein you eat doesn't matter whether it's gluten, whether it's casein, whether it's protein from meat or protein from peas or protein from beans or soya or anything else like that, all of it will absorb undigested. Right. Then your immune system finds these undigested proteins in your bloodstream, looks at them and says, you're not food. I don't recognize you as food and attacks them. Mm -hmm. It attaches to them various um, cells and structures. So it becomes a very big molecule. And wherever this molecule gets to in the body, gets stuck there, it causes inflammation in that mm -hmm. place. What is inflammation? Inflammation is a, a, an amazing, marvelous tool of the immune system for cleansing you, mm -hmm. for removing such debris, removing such contamination from your body. But inflammation feels uncomfortable because that place gets swollen and it's red and it's hot and it doesn't work and it mm -hmm. hurts. It's painful. So what do people do when they get inflammation? They run to the doctor and the doctor gives them a drug to stop inflammation. Yeah. So what have you done? You, you, you bash your immune system on the head so it cannot function by this drug. It's lying on the floor and hardly breathing your immune system. The only agent that you have in your body to protect you from that contamination. So people start reacting to food because food doesn't digest properly. You start developing multiple food allergies and intolerances. Some of them are anaphylactic, some of them are not. You know, some of them are recognized by mainstream medicine, some are not recognized by the mainstream medicine, but you are reacting pretty much to every food you eat. As long as your gut wall is like a sieve, mm -hmm. you're absorbing all of your food undigested. Doesn't matter whether you remove this food or you remove that food, as long as your gut wall continues having holes in it, you will continue reacting to every food you eat. What we do with GAPS protocol, we heal and seal the gut wall. Right. That's the whole point new. of the GAPS diet, to heal exactly. and seal the gut lining. Yes. That's right. We build a new gut wall for the person mm -hmm. from young, newly born cells, because, uh, you know, cells that line our gut only live two days, two, three days. Mm. They have a very short lifetime. And uh, so we have a real chance to renew the gut wall fairly quickly by giving birth to trillions of new cells which will seal all those holes we're building new healthy robust strong gut wall for the person so you could start to see benefits within a couple of days in that sense some people see benefits that quickly other people depends on how deep the damage is in the yeah. body and how far from the gut the toxins have accumulated okay. apart from the um, undigested foods a river of other toxins are absorbed through these holes mm -hmm. in the gut wall because these microbes which turn pathogenic now they convert the food that you eat into millions of poisons. These poisons absorb as well and they distribute around the body and cause disease. 
cause trouble everywhere. Mm -hmm. The immune system initially would use inflammation uh, because that's a tool that is ready to go. You don't need to do anything with it. You know, the immune system just grabs it and uses it. But then the immune system has other tools which require some time to develop, some time to sharpen, to create. So that's autoimmunity. Autoimmunity is another powerful tool that the immune system has. Mm -hmm. So if a toxin has absorbed from your digestive system and it keeps coming and keeps coming because you keep eating the same things and the same pathogenic microbes in the gut convert this food into the same poisons. And this, so these poisons keep coming. Every poison in the body looks for a compatible place, a dock mm -hmm. of sorts, a harbor where to park itself in your body. So they find molecules where they can fit in, sort of, like a, glo like a hand in glove, pretty much. In majority of cases, that's your collagen. Because three quarters of all protein in the human body is collagen. It's an elastic molecule, which creates the so-called connective tissue in mm -hmm. the body. And that's a structure of your body is made out of this molecule. The skeleton of your bones, the skeleton of your muscles, all your fascias, all the capsules of your organs, the sheaths where your nerves are traveling, the walls of all your cardiovascular system, the lining of your heart, the arteries, the veins, the capillaries, your skin, you know, all of it is connective tissue. They're all made out of collagen, largely. And collagen is a magnet for toxicity. Mm -hmm. It has the structure of molecule, which is actually quite universal for various, all kinds of toxins to dock, to attach themselves. When a toxin like that attaches itself to a molecule of collagen, your immune system finds it because your immune system always goes around surveying yeah. everything in your body, checking everything. And it finds this dirty collagen molecule, contaminates it, looks at it and says, you're not mine. Mm -hmm. So first the immune system would use inflammation to clean it up. Mm -hmm. Inflammation is perfect cleaner. It will remove the toxin and leave your collagen nice and clean. But it, uh, it's uncomfortable, it hurts, it swells and so on. But if inflammation is not enough, and on top of that, you're taking anti-inflammatory medications mm -hmm. that you got from the doctor, a month or two, the immune system realizes inflammation is not enough. Yeah. It by then will learn the configuration of that dirty collagen molecule, that mm -hmm. contaminated collagen molecule, and start producing specific cells called antibodies, which will come and gobble that molecule and remove it, mm -hmm. destroy it, basically. And you go to a doctor, the doctor takes a blood test and finds these specific cells mm -hmm. in your blood and says, oh, you've got an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. Your immune system is attacking your body. And now mainstream medicine believes, uh, they made you believe that um, in this situation, your immune system has gone silly, doesn't know what it's doing, attacking perfectly good tissues in your body. So what we need to do, we need to bash your immune system on the head with a big stick. So it just falls on the floor and can't work anymore. So they start giving you drugs for autoimmunity, which basically destroy your immune system. Yeah. The reality is that your immune system is never misguided. It's never silly. It always knows what it's doing. Yeah. It is not attacking clean collagen in your body. It's attacking dirty collagen, contaminated collagen, contaminated tissues. It's cleaning you up. Yeah. It's dealing with the situation. Once you've made your immune system disabled, through taking these medications from doctors, nobody's cleaning you. Yeah. You're piling up toxicity in your body. Your disease continues developing and eventually it will kill you. It will destroy you It will, or it'll cause cancer or, or something even more drastic and horrible. And so like, like you've just described, a really clear connection between the gut and autoimmunity, um, those clear connections exist with basically every condition that a person can be faced with, including um, mental health issues and um, basically Absolutely. any other health issue that you have. So um, we, we have, we, we're struggling um, as people because we really have no idea what to eat. <laughs> um, there's so many different um, pieces of advice and even even people like yourself, um, there are so many other people who are at the top of their game and they have, you know, they, they've been studying this for, you know, their, a lifetime. And, you know, even they have different advice. You know, everyone has different advice. So first of all, um, you talk about toxins and poisons and what are some of the biggest offenders that we should be looking out for? 
And then how can we go about um, starting a, a GAPS diet protocol? Like, how does that start? Because I know there's three different phases to it. So um, first of all, what are those biggest offenders that we should start thinking about taking out today? The biggest offenders in terms of food? Yes. Is yes. Wheat and sugar. Wheat and, and sugar. Okay, this so is the that, that, that'll be that flours, really, like flour, yeah, pastas, breads, and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. You know, we are surrounded. My farm is surrounded by industrial wasteland of arable industrial mm. fields. Mm. All they grow in rotation is wheat, sugar beet, rapeseed. Mm. Then again, wheat, sugar beet, rapeseed, flour, sugar, and vegetable oil. Mm. The three legs on which every disease stands. Mm. Nobody should be consuming these things, including animals and birds. Nobody. Mm. So these are the first three things to remove. And you will find no matter what diet you decide to follow in the world, you know, starting from carnivore, where people live entirely on meat, yes. to vegan, you know, and with everything in between. The first two months, every improvement you have comes from removing processed carbohydrates. Absolutely. Removing bread, pasta, everything made out of flour, sugar, soft drinks, breakfast cereals, porridges, you know, all of that. That's something we can all agree on. You know, that comes Absolutely. up time all after time. Yes. So no matter what you're actually eating, mm. the benefits in the first two months of you following any kind of diet come from removing these three things. So always remove them first. That is the most important thing. Then look at what your body needs. Mm. And the biggest offender, you know, talking about offenders in the world now, is vegetarianism. Pro-vegetarian propaganda, plant-based lifestyle. Because it is, it is now uh, pumped very powerfully in a very powerful way uh, upon the whole of humanity by Western governments, by governments all over the world, who are funded by the industrial complex, mm -hmm. industrial and military complex, by those global corporations which own everything, starting from agriculture to pharmaceuticals, to food industry, to medical industry, to governments. Mm -hmm. They own governments as well. So this propaganda comes to those people, from those people, from mm -hmm. them. Why? I describe all of this in detail in this little book called Vegetarianism Explained. Where the whole pro it's quite thin, it's got nice book pictures, so it's easy to read. <laughs> the old <laughs> signpost as well. That's <laughs> right, but it's a signpost, that's right. And it's uh, um, easy to read for teenagers, easy to read for any person, but it's fully referenced for scientists and for, for professionals. What we need to understand that and I only understood this when I became an organic farmer myself. On organic farms such as mine, the easiest thing to do is producing milk, meat, and eggs. Animals, as long as you, animals are birds, as long as you give them pasture, because all animals and birds should be on pasture, not in some building locked up, not in some prison, they need to be under the sunlight, on grasses, on herbs, free in nature, the way Mother Nature designed them to be, run around, you know, free. So as, as, as long as you provide them with that kind of environment, you are busy maybe in the morning milking, mm -hmm. feeding them, letting them out, and in the evening, putting them back to bed. Half an hour or so in the evening, that's it. The rest of the day is free. You can hold a full-time job somewhere if you <laughs> need to. And at the same time, have a farm and have your own meat, your own milk, and your own eggs. They're literally easy. But when it comes to growing plant matter on an organic farm, vegetables in particular, that's where all the hard work is. That's when 24 hour labor comes in. Because, you know, the yield is unpredictable on an mm -hmm. organic farm because the weather changes, you know, it rains at the wrong time, the sun shines at the wrong time, or some insects run away from some farmer's field where he sprayed some chemicals and found my organic garden. Oh. You know, you can do everything by the book and your carrots just don't grow. And you don't know what have I done wrong. Yeah, that must be <laughs> hard for you. But you're just like, what went wrong? I did everything right. <laughs> they just don't grow. So you never know when you're seeding in the spring, you never know what yield you will get, what will grow and what will not grow. Every year is different because the weather is different. Everything just changes every year. So that is the hardest thing to produce, vegetables. That is why humanity historically didn't eat vegetables. Mm -hmm. Because there were always because there was no industrial agriculture, it was difficult to produce. When we come to the industrial agriculture, these two things swap. Mm. 
Producing plant matter is easy. The yield is predictable, guaranteed, because the scientists have hybridized the seeds, they've coated the seeds in all these chemicals. Every seed is not a seed, it's a pellet coated in, in, in all sorts of chemicals. And there's a machine for this and a chemical for that. So in the farmers, it's all been worked out beautifully. Yeah. So the farmers are given these special machines, these chemicals, this special seed, all in pellets, hybridized. Now you plant the seed on day five, you spray this, on day 20, you spray that, on day 25, you spray this, and it works. You get yield, you get guaranteed yield, you, go, you have no weeds. It all looks beautiful, ordered, you know, like, like plastic cabbages, you know, it's straight rows. Perfect. Yeah, right. Perfect for the supermarket. And one farmer can serve thousands of acres, right. one human being. And soon they will replace them with robots anyway. Easy peasy to produce. And it's profitable for them to produce plant matter. But when it comes to producing meat, milk, and eggs, it's expensive, it's heartbreaking, and it doesn't work. And it's, uh, it, it causes them losses. It, it's not profitable for them. Because animals and birds just don't comply with industrial agriculture. Mm. So what you obey is techniques, techniques and, and rules. Because all animals and birds need to be on pasture. Right. They need sunlight. They need rain. They need more than 60 herbs and grasses growing in the pasture. It needs to be organic. They need to be loved and they need to be out there. Mm -hmm. you know in the fresh air and you need to move them all the time you can't just build a fence and lock them up and forget about them you have mm -hmm. to move them every few days yeah so the pasture survives and grows they don't destroy it and they get fresh grass all the time and fresh herbs and and the chickens get fr fresh worms and insects that they dig that's their meat mm -hmm. you know do you know where the yellow color in the egg yolk comes from um oh gosh from I'm herbs not, and I'm grasses not, that right, chickens yeah, yeah, eat in yeah. abundance Carotenoids in herbs and grasses turn the, the egg yolk into almost orange, yellow color. Yeah, and that's vitamin A, that's very nutritious for us. Yeah. Do you know where the yellow color comes from in a supermarket egg? Um, gosh, grains? From a synthetic dye added into their yeah, feet. No way. Which wow. one's going to give you good health? Yeah, well, obviously. So chickens orange, and turkeys yeah. need to be on pasture. They cannot be locked in some cages in yeah. misery. Yeah. Fed synthetic, uh, you know, agriculture, synthetic feed, God knows what, and then murdered at, at, at a very young age, you know, and it's what, what the industrial agriculture has done because it's profitable for them to produce plant matter and unprofitable to produce uh, meat, eggs and meat with their model where they take all the animals and chickens and, and birds from pasture and lock them up in these prisons called CAFOs, mm -hmm. confined animal factory operation. Hence and why they're pushing many, vegetarianism, many veganism. Exactly. You see many films of the cruelty of those places. Mm, yeah. Absolute yeah, horrendous cruelty yeah. of those places. And people watch those films and think, all right, I'll become a vegan. Mm. What you're doing, you're playing right, right into the gate of this, right into the basket of these uh, monopolies, mm. of these um, global corporations. They want the whole planet to be vegan because that's where their profit is. And they want to get rid of animal husbandry because it's, it's unprofitable for them. On top of that, they invested billions into synthetic meat, synthetic milk, synthetic eggs. Synthetic meat is already in supermarkets. Synthetic milk is already in supermarkets. Eggs are coming. Real animal husbandry is a competition for these products. Mm -hmm. That is why Western governments now are dead set on destroying animal husbandry. You probably have seen what's happening in Holland what's happening in other European countries, they're destroying animal husbandry. They're trying to get rid of all animals in, in the farms. So, so people what, eat synthetics. So, so what's the best thing that someone can do um, to, like straight away if they want to start supporting, um, you know, con the continuation of farming of animals and like the healthy um, farming and like how, how can we go about supporting that? There are hundreds of real, organic, loving farmers in every country. Mm. We've got hundreds in Britain. So the first thing that everybody should do in cities, in towns, in villages, everywhere, you must abandon the supermarket. Mm. We should stop buying our food in supermarkets. Go to your local farmer's market, talk to the farmers there, get their contact details and ask them, can I visit your farm? Mm -hmm. A real organic farmer will be delighted. Yeah, because they've got nothing to hide. There will be no bags of chemicals for you to see. Mm. There will be no refrigerators full of antibiotics and steroids for you to yeah. see. 
you will see that animals. So everybody just got weekends. Mm. Put your kids in the car, take your dog and go and have a lovely day visiting a farm. You know, and uh, you will see animals on pasture. You will see chickens on pasture. You will see a human being that you can look into his eyes and see that you can trust this person. Mm -hmm. This is a person who loves his land, loves his animals, loves his chickens, loves his soil, loves his gardens and, and, and does everything with love. So his food that he produces carries energy of love mm -hmm. because food is information. Yes. We eat information for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What kind of information are you buying in the supermarket? Mm -hmm. You're buying information of abuse, greed, suffering, pain, grief. How are you going to get good health from that? Mm -hmm. When you buy from a farmer, directly from a farmer like that, you buy love. Every piece of food that you'll be eating from there will carry energy of love, information yeah. of love. Only that energy can give you good health. Yeah. No other information can give you good health. So once you found a few farmers like that around your city, it just takes one Saturday to drive around and stock up for the week mm -hmm. for your family. Not only you will be feeding your family the best food possible, but you will be supporting good farmers because organic farmers in the Western world are under great pressure from the governments. The governments make their lives miserable. The yeah. government is their biggest enemy because the Western governments are funded and stocked and uh, staffed by uh, global corporations, by those big guys, and they support them. They support industrial agriculture. Organic sector is their enemy, so they, they do their best to destroy organic sector as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So the farmers that survive in an organic sector are the ones that have a strong customer base where right. people buy directly from the farm without any middlemen. Right. And uh, I usually put my clients in touch in cities so they form little groups. So you don't have to drive yourself every Saturday to get your food. You know, if you have a group like that, you can have a rotor. This week, this family drives and brings food for the whole group. Next week, it's somebody else. And you just, all it takes them to pop around to their house or apartment uh, in the city and pick up your bits and pieces. Um, so all it takes is getting idea. organized. Yeah. Getting organized. And you will be getting good food and you will be laying a good foundation for your um, for the health of your family. That is so good to hear. And it's just such a fabulous, it's such a fabulous thing that you're doing and that other people are doing um, for the sake of their health for themselves and their family. Um, I'm really aware of time. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you um, about the GAPS diet. Now, I know this is a big topic, so I know that we're tight on time right now. But just, you know, you've talked us through the foods that we should be avoiding. Just overall, in summary, what sort of foods should we be including into our diets? What we need to understand, and I describe it in every book, but if you want to have a quick summary, please read this book, this vegetarian book, and give it to everybody who considers to become a vegetarian or, or a vegan. Uh, what I explained here, that Mother Nature gave us two groups of foods, mm -hmm. animal foods and plant foods. Animal foods are meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. Plant foods are grains, beans, nuts, seeds, plants, vegetables, fruit. Uh, you know things like that so human digestive system is not designed to digest plants because the basic fact that we've known from 1930s from basic sciences is that the only things on our planet that can truly digest plant matter are microbes microbes mm. mother nature used that scientific fact in creating the digestive system of herbivorous animals cows, goats, deer, giraffe, antelope, and so on. Mm -hmm. It gave them huge stomachs with several, several stomachs. A cow mm -hmm. has three enormous stomachs, which collectively are called rumen, full of microbes, stuffed full of microbes. So the cow is not digesting the grass herself. It's that microbial community in her rumen that digests the grass for her. They do the work for her mm -hmm. because no other creature on the planet can digest plants only microbes. We human beings haven't got a rumen. We have one tiny stomach, very small compared to the cow, and only one. Thank God. And this stomach, <laughs> that's right. And this stomach produces hydrochloric acid. 
the acidity can go down in pH down to one when you're mm -hmm. hungry. Very hostile environment for any microbes. That is why a healthy stomach in a person and a healthy person is virtually sterile. It has mm -hmm. virtually no microbes in it. But this acidic environment and other elements of the stomach juice are ideal for digesting meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. While plants do not digest at all in our stomachs, they need microbes to be digested. Mm -hmm. And they land into a sterile environment. So the only things that human stomach is capable of digesting are meat, fish, eggs, and dairy, animal foods. Then this whole mixture gets passed into several meters of intestines where absorption of food happens. And the only things that can absorb are the things that got properly digested. So not plants. Plants, again, just may give some juices, a few vitamins, a few minerals, a few little cofactors there. But the bulk of what your body is made of comes only from animal foods. And that is protein and fat. When we analyze human protein and human fat in a lab, we find that they're almost identical in their biochemical structure with proteins and fats which come from animal foods. Meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. Mm -hmm. Plants have lots of proteins, lots of fats, but they have a very different biochemical structure incompatible with our protein and our fat. It's very difficult for the human body to convert plant protein and plant, plant fats into our structure and very easy to absorb proteins and fats from animal foods. So animal foods are the foods that feed and build your body, yeah. the body you live in. It makes your body, they make this, these foods, they nourish you properly, they feed you properly, they make your body strong and robust. Plants do not feed us, they can't. All they do, they provide cleansing substances. So we eat plant matter to give us some flavors, to give us colors, to give us some fun, and to give us some, um, uh, some cofactors to keep us clean on the yes. inside. But animal foods also provide lots of cleansing substances. Yeah. And my patients from all over the world, particularly children, small children with severe conditions such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and mental illness, and there's a, there's a terrible new disease called f pies in babies. Uh, it's, it's when a baby is allergic to every protein on the planet. You know, this baby is literally just... And there's protein die. in pretty much everything. That's right, die or develop severe mental and physical disabilities. So what these patients have taught me that human beings can live perfectly well without eating plants at all. Okay. So you're, a, put, you're a supporter of the carnivore diet. That's right. <laughs> I put okay. these patients on a variety of GAPS diet, which is called no plant GAPS diet. Mm -hmm. Not a speck, not a leaf, nothing out of plant kingdom is consumed. And when we do that, when the person lives entirely on meat, fish, eggs, and dairy, properly prepared, of course, the GAPS way, we start healing, we start getting rosy cheeks, we start growing, we start developing mentally, diseases disappear, melt away in these children and adults. And I have quite a, a cohort now of adults and children who have been on this diet for several years, quite a few years, and they have no intentions of introducing plants. So these people have taught me the fact that human beings can live perfectly well on animal foods only, entirely. Um, but yeah. thousands of vegans and vegetarians who came to me with mental illness, with horrendous physical illnesses, their bodies destroyed through vegetarianism and veganism, have taught me that human beings cannot live entirely on plant foods. Mm. Absolutely not. Because plants do not feed us. They only clean up, cleanse us. So veganism is not a diet. It is a form of fasting. There are many forms of fasting. I have a chapter on fasting in this green book uh, where I explained these different forms of fasting and what their benefits are. Fasting is biblical. Fasting is as old as the hills. And uh, many people recover from all kinds of severe illnesses with fasting. But fasting should not be done longer than 40 days, mm. maximum. Preferably no longer than 21 days. Because you cannot fast forever. Yeah. Nobody can fast forever, right? And uh, when people go on a fast, any kind of fast, initially in the first couple of weeks, they start feeling better okay. because a less polluted body feels better than a toxic one. And that's the time when they write their evangelical blogs and their you know, books and 
tell the whole world how wonderful veganism is, how wonderful vegetarianism is. But then at a certain point, their body finishes cleansing. And it tells them, I'm hungry now, feed me. And the way the body tells them, it gives them desire for roast chicken, for bacon, for eggs, for cheese, for animal foods, animal fat, pot of cream, for something like that. But by then, all these vegans have convinced the whole world that veganism is the best thing since sliced bread. You know, they don't listen to their body. They force it to continue cleansing when the body asks to be fed. For political reasons, emotional reasons, religious reasons, any kind of other, other reason, you know. And uh, at that point, the body has no choice but to start breaking down muscle and bone to feed more important organs, to feed your brain, to feed your heart your lungs, your liver, and other vital organs so that you survive. So these people start losing muscle mass, they start losing bone mass, they start developing neurological illnesses, hormonal abnormalities, menstruation stop, libido disappears, because the body simply has no resources for wasting on these things. And their brain starts shrinking. We see that on scans, MRI scans and CT scans, that literally the brain starts shrinking. And these people become hangry. That's the term in this. Mm, you know, I know that made term. out of two yes. words, angry and hungry. Yeah. The brain is starving. So the person becomes angry. These are angry people. They're very intolerant. They're very evangelical. They berate everybody for eating meat. They go and, you know, become sort of revolutionaries <laughs> in that area. And their cognitive ability declines their intelligence declines and their memory declines. But of course, they cannot perceive that themselves. They don't realize that they're losing their brain. Other people might be too polite to mention this to them. They just shy away from these people. They lose their brains. And they don't realize what they're doing to their bodies, that they're destroying themselves. Veganism and vegetarianism, it is possible to be a healthy vegetarian, but you have to put a huge amount of effort into fermenting all your plant matter to make it more digestible and into eating some animal foods to sustain the physical structure of your body. And majority of vegetarians do it with high fat dairy and with eggs. And occasionally they would eat fish and meat mm -hmm. to sustain the physical structure of their bodies. It is possible to do that. Uh, such cultures exist in India and you do have to live in a hot climate to do that. The colder the climate is where you live, the more meat and fat you need to survive. Mm -hmm. If you live somewhere in tropics, subtropics, you can be a vegetarian and be okay you know, because the body doesn't need as much as much resources. You've, you've said so many uh, powerful things in the last 10 minutes. Um, I have so many questions, but I'm going to whittle it down to um, just some practical practical questions because I'm thinking about myself, I'm thinking about my family and my friends and when when you say um I'm, I'm really stuck on this when you say vegetables and I, I presume you mean fruit as well um so you say that we don't actually need those <laughs> they're just oh. for like for pleasure and for you know cleansing are you referring to fiber and um you know the phytochemicals is that what you're referring to when you say cleansing well not only fiber mm. uh, plants plants present us with a whole caboodle of substances which are called anti-nutrients actually right yeah you know yeah. salicylates lectins all, you know enzyme inhibitors all, all sorts of things are you saying are we don't need them necessarily but they're, they're just they're for pleasure they're powerful cleansers right okay these chemicals are powerful cleansers they cleanse you that is why some cleansing and detox protocols are mm. vegan okay okay but remember veganism is a fast mm. you can fast on water entirely or you can fast on juices, or you can fast just on a mono fast, eating maybe only apples or only mm. grapes or only milk. If you go to goat, you can only drink goat milk and nothing else. Mm -hmm. You know, and you will achieve a, a fast. There are many forms of fasting, yes. and veganism is one of them. It's a form of fasting. Okay. Fiber is a hoax, the same with um, uh, starch. Mm. Our mainstream sciences, which are funded by the same global corporations, the same people, um, they have spent huge funds on researching fiber and starch and trying to convince the whole world that fiber and starch are the best things ever and everybody should be just living on those things. 
25 grams a day that's the guideline I that's what we're advised and... nutritionists we're advised to you know say 25 grams meet your quota exactly exactly yeah. no, no, no. we don't need these things at all and majority of people in the western world are now gaps which makes them incapable of handling fiber and starch because fiber and starch feed microbes all microbes good and bad beneficial pathogenic any of them if a person has a healthy, robust, balanced gut flora, by eating starch and fiber, you'll feed that microbial community. It will get stronger and healthier. It will make you stronger and healthier as a result. Mm -hmm. Problem is, how many of those people are left in the world with our chemical activity and our chemical load? Majority of people are gaps. And if you have pathogenic gut flora mm -hmm. with pathogenic microbes dominating there, fiber and starch will feed those microbes make them stronger and bigger and they will make you very sick okay so if someone has that is why fiber flora, and starch cause more harm than good that's right that's how fiber and starch have become the enemy of humanity generally speaking anything the mainstream tells you you have to turn upside down and then you will see the truth interesting i think i'll put that on like a quote <laughs> anything you see turn upside down i like that um, so basically, what, my, what I'm gathering from you is base your diet around animal protein, because that's what we're designed to, to eat. Um, have fruits and vegetables um, by all means, but, you know, have them for pleasure and, you know, just maybe use them for a fast. Um, what are your thoughts on bone broth fast then in this case? Because in your, your gaps, no, first stage of your gaps is basically a bone broth no. fast, right? No, 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 no. There are two. two uh, there is a, a misconception in the world called the bone broth. Right. No, okay. In the gaps diet, yeah. we use meat stock. Right. There That's is a correct. difference between the yeah. two. We do That's not right. use bone broth. We use meat stock. Okay. Meat stock is made out of a chunk of animal where you don't remove anything. There's yes, a bone right. in the middle. There's a joint. There's meat. There's skin. If it's pork, got everything. You know, yeah. Everything's there, and you put that in a pan and you fill it up, cover it with water, add salt and spices, and cook for three, four hours. Yeah. And the stock that results of that is clear, delicious, beautiful. That is called meat stock. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is what we're using in the GAPS diet. The meat that you've made this stock with is delicious, wonderful, makes a fantastic meal. Mm -hmm. Several meals. That's what, what we use. This meat stock is rich in collagen. Mm -hmm. Remember, three quarters of your body is collagen, of protein in your body. Yeah. Yeah. You, as we live in a toxic environment, particularly if you're a GAPS star, you are damaging your collagen, you are losing your collagen. Mm -hmm. That is why the result of that, when people start losing their collagen, they start bruising very easily. You know, you've lifted a chair and you've got a bruise on your hand. You think, my goodness, I haven't done anything. Why? Um, because the blood vessels are made out of collagen. You're losing collagen. Your blood vessels are becoming weak. Mm -hmm. They break easily. You become clumsy because your joints become weak. They don't give you good support. You start getting back pain and subluxation of your vertebrae because mm -hmm. your whole spinal column is hundreds of joints mm -hmm. and every joint has ligaments and capsules and liquid inside and all the other surfaces all of which are largely collagen mm -hmm. you're losing that so your spine becomes loose it doesn't give you good support so you start getting back pain in different places you become clumsy, you, you start getting prolapse of organs, your organs are hanging too low, giving you various symptoms because every organ hangs on ligaments and capsules, which are made out of collagen. You can have hernias, all sorts of things happen. I described this situation uh, in the blue book. Right. In detail. Right. So, because um, I know that the, the GAPS diet is uh, made up of stages. So the first stage is um, meat stocks and introducing, um, you know, softened, softened vegetables, you know, so that they're easy to digest. And then you move on to the actual GAPS diet, which can last years or a lifetime. There are several varieties of the GAPS diet. Yeah, yeah. There are several stages, so you yes, need to study yes. it. It's a very complex and long it subject. It is, yeah. We can't go into oh, it now. <laughs> um so so anybody who's listening um in natasha's book um in most of her books actually um the uh diet is broken down and also i have to say um plenty of youtube presentations as well by yourself where you you go into it in a lot more detail so um there's plenty of resources for people to find on how to actually take on the gaps diet and just one last question um would you say that the majority of us could 
you know, benefit from going on the GAPS diet um, in course. some way. Yes, that's what I thought. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Yeah. I, do. I live on it. Yeah. I live yeah. on it. Yes, I live on this diet. I keep my whole family on this diet. And as a result, we're never ill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can withstand any stress. Mm -hmm. We're strong. You know, so, GAPS diet, they say, makes you strong, not only physically, but mentally. So yeah. you're not so easily bamboozled and deceived by the mainstream. And uh, it makes you spiritually strong, mm. which is very important. Veganism makes you weak, physically, mentally, and spiritually. So you are easily deceived, easily bamboozled, and easily taken advantage of. So I, I think everybody, everyone in the Western world in particular needs to go on a gap style, at least temporarily or at least partially. Right, until... At least read the book. Until at least read the book. Okay. Um, and I presume until your illnesses are over, until you yeah. recover from your various illnesses, because majority of people are um, are living with a poor health. Yeah, they just get used to it. They don't know any other different, and they consider maybe like that's even something like rashes or headaches or insomnia. You know, things that we get every day that we think nothing of. You know, that's a sign, right? That that's something's not right. So maybe the gaps Absolutely. diet is a good place to start for everyone. Absolutely yeah i love that oh gosh this was such a fabulous conversation and like i i was getting some goose pimples i have to say towards the end when you were kind of on a rampage about um the stomachs and the animal proteins i was just like wow my gosh everything just kind of comes together doesn't it when you think about it in that sense but um how how is the best um how is the best way for people to find out more about you i mean obviously you're all over the internet but what is your preferred way of people to find you my main website is called gaps.me, yes. G-A-P-S dot me, I mean, I can actually put it into chat, I think, mm. that would be, might be easiest, yeah. because I have several resources, gaps.me, that's my main website. Okay. For people who would like to get trained mm. in different aspects of uh, gaps, we have gapstraining.com, here we have training courses for professionals, training courses for non-professional people who want mm -hmm. to make gaps their profession and start helping other people we have courses for um, ex expecting parents or parents who already have a baby and who are concerned and mm -hmm. worried and would like the best for their baby want to avoid all the pitfalls go on that course you will be explained everything you will you will make sure that your baby grows healthy and robust and you protect your baby we have to protect our children from the mainstream nowadays more and more yeah. Uh, we have a courses for people who are ill and difficult for them to read the book, difficult to wrap their brain around the whole gaps concept. If you join that course, it's it's uh, starting the for, for beginners. If you join that course, you will be guided, literally taken by the hand by very professional people, very knowledgeable people mm -hmm. who will take you through your illness. You can accomplish that course as slowly as you need to as you go through the whole uh, thing, they will answer all your questions, you will be guided. We have an army of um, GAPS practitioners, GAPS practitioners and coaches who are on GAPS.me. Yeah. Yeah, who are on GAPS.me. Mm -hmm. And we uh, started the <clears throat> GAPS Science Foundation. Okay. Science Foundation. Yeah, we're doing um, research to show that GAPS works. <clears throat> we already published four papers and we're working on more. So anybody who would like to support us, please do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> uh, on there because this is a charity, okay. um, GAPS Science Foundation. We have a group of researchers who are now working to show that GAPS works for those who are scientifically minded and need this kind of support. Yeah. Wow, fabulous. Well, I mean, your work continues to be incredible and um, you're continuing to um, make a huge impact um, in the world. So um, again, thank you so much. Thank you for the work that you do and thank you for coming on to this podcast and just sharing your knowledge. Um, I can see you're passionate about it and it's your life and um, I just I really appreciate that so um, I just want to say a big big thank you again and this was absolutely fabulous thank you very much and thank you for your work thank you for spreading the word